Welcome back to Real Estate Mindset and happy Thursday, June 6th. I have a really good story for you guys today on institutional investors in the housing market that are currently in distress. And there's certain facts that we know. Fact number one is we have proof and evidence that, you know, these are no longer forever houses, that institutional investors are selling houses. And we also have evidence now that some of these listings in some of these markets are being sold for 20% under what these new home builders listed those properties for in 2022. And so today I have an aspiring investigative journalist on the housing market here to help answer these questions. If you guys like what he has to say, go to his YouTube channel, Real Estate Watchman, or rather R.E. Watchman. Really, really cool guy. I've actually uh, been to his house in San Antonio when we did a boots on the ground video. He's very heavy on boots on the ground. And he also loves data vis. Uh, so just, you know, all around good guy. And sir, I really appreciate you being here, uh, Sean. But, you know, help us understand what's going on with institutional investors. And if you can, I know there's a lot to talk about. You know, tell the viewers your background. Obviously, you're in San Antonio. But let's start with first key. And let's start what's going on regarding the 400 Lennar homes that they purchased in the San Antonio area. And, and Sean, how are you today, brother? <laughs> hey, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me and all you do for the real estate mindset community. So really grateful to be here. Yes, sir. So, you know, I appreciate your time. This was a last minute. I think this is one of your first podcasts. So, you know, to the viewers, bear with him. I appreciate your courage, but it's just you and I, brother. And, you know, you know tell us what's going on with First Key and, and who they are. Sure. So First Key Homes is private equity. Uh, they, you know, essentially have bought 400 plus Lennar new construction homes in San Antonio. But what I notice is that they've started actually now selling homes in most of those communities where they bought homes just two years ago in San Antonio and several okay. of them at a you know pretty steep discount. So would you like me to go ahead and show kind of the, the visuals here or do you want to start with? Yeah. And, and I'm going to share uh, Sean's screen now, you guys. But, you know, some of the questions that I'll be asking Sean and hopefully will answer during this video is, is, you know, why? Right. Why are these institutional sellers, institutional investors selling these properties that they're supposed to be holding this forever? Is it a non-performing asset problem? Is it a liquidity squeeze? And then also, how can us as normal U.S. citizens do this type of investigative research in our own local housing markets to find this out? Because, Sean, if I'm a buyer on the sideline, potential future buyer on the sideline, and I'm seeing this in my market, I'm seeing institutional investors fire sell their homes. I like that. Uh, that's good. If I just bought, it's not good. Uh, but if I'm on the sideline, it's good. And so we'll ask those questions. Uh, there's your screen, brother. Tell us what's going on. Sure, absolutely. And, uh, and I appreciate you saying that because I am just a consumer. I do like working with data and I do that professionally. But I started looking into this and it was interesting. You know, the more layers you peel back, the more things you find. And I think this really all started when you all visited San Antonio. There was American Homes for Rent, who's a large institutional investor. They had a home for sale at a deep discount, which I shared with you all. You showed in the video. And we then found that they had actually sold you know, 600 plus homes in Texas in 2023 after years of being a net buyer. So clearly they were shifting. Um, and so as I found you know, some of these examples of first key homes, you can look, this is a map of the, I'll start with the, the homes that they purchased. So most of these, you know, around 2022, 2023, and you can see that they're in clumps here. I'll zoom in for one example. You know, a lot of people will say institutional investors only own a small percentage of the market, which is true, but it's not a small percentage of your market or your neighborhood if you're in this area right here. So they purchased all of these homes as new construction from Lennar. And so then if I if I zoom back out, you can see, you know, handful of neighborhoods here on different parts of the city. And, and I think the specific parts they bought in is a whole nother interesting story. But uh, if you if you look now, I'm going to also show these are the homes that they have listed for sale. Right. So you can see that it's pretty much a few homes in each of the neighborhoods where they bought these large chunks of homes. So we're talking about usually about a quarter of the street on many of these streets 
were bought by First Key Homes. And so, again, you know, now they're selling a few of them in each of those neighborhoods. And the question is, why? So soon after mm-hmm. they bought so many, why are they selling them now? Uh, and just real quick, Sean, you know, I just want to give you props because what I'm viewing right now is it's very impressive uh, how you're able to take that data and visualize it. And to the viewers, what he's showing you, the first map he showed you is how many homes first key purchased. And first key is an institutional investor that has been purchasing single family residences in the San Antonio area. Now they've bought high concentrations. He's showed you clusters of these houses. Obviously, if you're an existing homeowner in those areas, it's very, very bad. Uh, and now the second chart that he showed, again, amazing data visualization, is the same institutional investor, First Key, who purchased all these Lennar homes in 2022 and in 2023, is now going against the narrative now that the housing market is solid and stable and that these houses will be held forever and are now selling them. Again, amazing data. And so it brings us to the next thing, like you said, Sean, is why are they doing this? Right. And just observations I can make as just a normal consumer with public information would be one, they obviously haven't been able to get the rents that they thought in some of these areas, right? Which is interesting in light of what's been happening in San Antonio recently. So on the multifamily side, you know, the local news here reported recently that apartment occupancy is at 87% and expected to drop to 84% by the end of the year. So we have, you know, kind of more supply on the rental side. So they weren't able to get the rents they expected. They're also having their property taxes increase significantly. So as we've had inflation in the housing sector, that obviously then affects your appraised values. It then leads to higher property taxes. And in a high tax percentage state like Texas, where individuals have caps on how much their taxes can go up by each year, the investors don't have those caps. They also don't get the exemptions that individuals get. So they're seeing rents lower than what they expected, higher costs in the form of property taxes than what they expected. So now here they are selling. Okay. I mean, you know, and do you, another question, you know, obviously what you covered is, is they they could be manipulating values for uh, tax assessment purchases, which is a huge thing for cap rate here in Texas or the yield or profit an investor would make. That is possible. I uh, will say as someone that protests assessed value in Texas, you know, usually they they use three-year-old comps. So, you know, it is possible they're doing that, but I really like how you honed into the non-performance of these, you know, so-called assets, essentially no longer performing the same way. And I wonder, Sean, do you think another reason is, you know, that they may be selling is a liquidity squeeze, you know, all of the quantitative tightening, the lag effects. Do you think that, Potentially, they are selling these houses to get the money, and maybe the money is to stay in business longer, to keep the doors longer. Maybe it's to invest in a future uh, crash in prices. But what are your thoughts on them selling because they need the money right now? I mean, it's certainly a possibility. I think First Key Homes is a little different than, let's say, a public company where, so American Homes for Rent, they have public financials. You can go and you see that they sold all of those homes. This is private equity, so you don't have quite the visibility into their financials. Um, I, you know, could it be? Absolutely. I mean, I think more than anything, I'm a citizen asking the questions. I don't necessarily have the answers. I think that's an interesting uh, theory for sure. And you know, I, I think especially as you've read other articles recently, I know uh, Business Insider has reported on REITs, you know, having financial troubles and and needing to sell assets and things like that. I mean, it, it's definitely a plausible uh, you know, reason. And they do have, this is only kind of one category of what they're selling, right? They have hundreds of homes for sale at least um, you know, in my local area. Uh, but they, you know, this is just sort of one subset. I think this, this one is the interesting subset because they just bought them a few years ago, right? And they own so many others that are just like it. They're on the same street, they're in the same new build community. That's why this sort of category is interesting to me, but they're selling plenty of other homes and it could be for any number of, you know, liquidity reasons, other things like you're suggesting. 
I mean, I would, I would think so. And and if you can share your screen again, Sean, can you show the viewers? You know, again, we don't have to guess. We don't have to use our emotions. Let's just show them what's happening. You know, like right now. Can you show them, Sean, the listing that you were able to find on Zillow that is showing significant price reductions? Uh, I believe this is from the Institutional Investor First Key. Let me share your. Uh, can you can you tell the audience what we're looking at here? Let me move us out of the way. Sure. So this is a home listed for sale. It's in one of these communities where First Key has bought a number of new built homes from Lennar. It's listed at 285. But if you scroll down into the history here on Zillow, and again, I'm a, you know I'm a citizen. I'm not a realtor. I don't have access to MLS to really look at sale prices. So this is all that I have available is the list price. But you can see that essentially Lennar listed it in April of 2022, which was a hot time for the market at 354. First key now listed it for sale in February of 24 for 315, but they've dropped it over the last few months all the way down to here at the end of May 285. So and that is Sean, it says a I think it says $149 a square foot. Scroll back down if you can. What was the original listing price after they purchased it from Lennar? How much was that a square foot? 165. Okay, so pretty substantial drop if you want to just look at the price per square foot. Right, absolutely. I mean, you know, some people, you could say, okay, well, maybe they didn't pay the sticker price from Lennar in April. They're a large investor, possibly. But even if you just look at the history of what they tried to sell it for initially and how long, you know, it's sitting and they're dropping the price, the fact that they're continuing to drop the price here is is really interesting. Yeah, and and these price drops are happening. It looks like every two to three weeks, if I'm not mistaken. So it, that's why I'm saying it. It kind of looks like a little bit of a liquidity squeeze. If the house market was so resilient in our markets, at least there would be no need to drop the price of your house. You know, every, once every two weeks for a period of months. Um, this is very. Interesting. Now, you know, what I try to tell viewers, Sean, is that this is it is concentrated in Texas. Texas, we have a lot of institutional investors. We see multiple institutional investors selling their products, but this is also turning into a nationwide problem, a nationwide occurrence to where these institutional investors are selling for one reason or another. Now, can you tell the viewers, Sean, from your boots on the ground experience in the Texas state, uh, in the San Antonio area? Have you seen anything going on from any other institutional investors? Obviously, you mentioned American Homes for Rent. We covered that. Uh, you kind of alluded to uh, maybe fund fundraise that, that where you could invest ten dollars of your money uh, to be an owner of a house. Them in distress. Will you touch on what else you're seeing in your market from other institutional investors? Absolutely. And so that listing that I showed you didn't preserve the rent history, but if you look at not only the sale price, if you look at the rent, you'll see that they did the same thing. As far as other institutional investors selling, um, this is an interesting story that I came across, uh, Fundrise. So essentially, Fundrise is trying to market themselves as a way for you to in invest as little as $10 into their platform, and they go buy real estate. And you know they, they say it will unlock the kind of real estate capabilities of large private equity for you as if you have only $10. And so that, that's what they're pitching. But one of the things I noticed is there's a community, it's a build for rent community that Fundrise purchased. And if you read about it on their website, it had a lot of, they gave a lot of reasons for why they did that. A lot of them were very specific to 20, 2020, 2021, the pandemic. They had, gave a lot of pandemic reasons for why they purchased this build for rent community. They said it it would be a great place for social distancing, you know, that they, they have yards instead of uh, because they're built for rent single family homes instead of apartments. People may not want to live in apartments, et cetera, because of you know what was happening at that time. Well, they originally planned to buy 120 homes, build and buy 120 homes, uh, you know, build for rent. But what happened is they've now built 60 and they've turned around and they're selling two of them. So they had this plan to, to build twice as many as what they actually have. And now they're seemingly pivoting in some sense in that they own the rest of the homes in this community as built for rent, right? So the fact that I could, as just a normal consumer, 
go on Zillow, see a home for sale, and not probably realize that this was a build for rent community owned by this kind of fintech company that's that's for investing, right? So that that's mm -hmm. interesting and kind of odd. And um, I think we're about to get a little bit of uh, background noise for just momentarily from from the baby. So sorry about that. No, you're good. I mean, you know, I if I'm a buyer, I wouldn't personally want to be one of the only owners in a subdivision. And I wouldn't necessarily want to be surrounded by renters, not because I think renters are bad people, not at all. But generally, Sean, there's a different pride of ownership. Uh, generally, a renter is going to beat the property up, call the landlord if there's any issues, the landlord's going to be cheap and probably not want to do anything. And so it's a different pride of ownership. You know, maybe there's more issues. Yeah. Maybe. Go ahead. I, I mean, I agree. This is not necessarily to say anything negative about, you know, people who are renting at all. It's to say, hey, if I'm making this large financial decision, I at least want to have the information to know that that's what the case is. And consider that rather than because if you go to, you know, if you go to the the listing for this fundrise build for rent home for sale, it says, you know, it's located in the coveted community of I forget the name of the community. But so I thought, well, what's so coveted about that community? OK, well, it's a build for rent community. Right. And so, OK, if you know that it's one thing, but a, a consumer could go in and, and have no idea. And so one of the communities that I did. I went into the neighborhood. I, I talked to one of the neighbors and I said, hey, you know, there's some interesting things going on here. I have a YouTube channel. I'm looking at real estate. And they had no idea. They said, what kind of interesting things are going on here? And I said, and, and I said, well, you know, this large investor came and bought all these homes. She said, well, I did notice a lot of them were listed for rent and hadn't they'd been listed for rent for a long time, but they didn't know. So they made this purchase. And even if the institutional investor got a discount on the purchase price, you know, when they bought. So let's say that one example we looked at, the 2022 price. Let's say the investor didn't pay that price. Well, I'm not as interested in that as I am, did some consumer pay list price in 2022? And was their incentive in the form of a rate rather than a discount on the price? And if so, if an investor comes in and buys them much cheaper, well, that affects the individual, right? Of course. Yeah, because now the individual has a home that's no longer worth what they paid for it. And, you know, here's the thing, you, you know, kind of hit me when when you were saying and talking about uh, Fundrise, them purchasing a build to rent community in the outskirts of San Antonio really hurts it. You know, the way of life, the quality of life and the level of affordability that those citizens had. I mean, a lot of those citizens mo intentionally, and this is prior to COVID, I'm saying, the locals uh, intentionally moved out of the city to go to these affordable places. And then you have these, I don't know how else to say, these greedy institutional investors that wreak havoc in these areas. And now some of these areas appear to be in great distress. Uh, and so to kind of just recap us, Sean, you know, we talked about potential, you know, the why, right? We talked about liquidity. Maybe they need liquidity. To me, as someone that, you know, is kind of reviewing and looking at what you're saying, trying to, you know, as a citizen, how do I interpret this? The price cuts to me show the need for liquidity. If, if they can't hold on the market, if there's no one willing to purchase these houses, uh, if they're selling for under market value, it's distress. It, they're selling in distress under market value. Uh, and so there, that would suggest liquidity issues. But also, you mentioned property taxes. In Texas, we have crazy property taxes, especially, especially Sean, as you know, on new builds, new build property taxes are generally way higher than right. existing. Oh, there was absolutely, generally. there was one. 1,187 square foot house where the property taxes were $4,000. And I do I mean, think I, a lot of people go into their purchases not really having an accurate idea on what their property taxes will be, especially for existing. They look at what they were, but maybe the person who previously lived there had these caps in place from Homestead where the yeah. taxes were only going up by a certain amount per year. I've seen a lot of situations where people bought existing homes, investors and individuals. They bought existing homes. The taxes skyrocketed. And now two years later, they're turning around and selling. So one example of that, if we're speaking of institutional investors, was uh, Blackstone was selling. Um, you know, There's been a lot written about them recently and potential liquidity issues for them. There was an example where 
you know, the taxes skyrocketed. Um, there's a there's a, a an affiliated company. It's um, Home Partners of America. Uh, that's kind of a subsidiary, and they were selling one of these homes where clearly they bought it. The taxes went way up because of the inflation we've had, and I think a lot of people weren't expecting that or didn't you know they they didn't realize that that was going to be the case. Well, and I mean this, you can kind of say the same thing about these institutional investors as it pertains to the increased interest rates, uh, but also the property taxes. My point being is, you know, not only do we have that double whammy, it's a liquidity, uh, but potentially the performance of their assets being that you and I boots on the ground understand property taxes, especially on new builds, it's been skyrocketing. And they don't have homestead protection on property taxes. Homestead protection, you have to, it has to be your primary residence. If you own the house, you have to live there. And then you have homestead protection. And so that's a double whammy. But really, Sean, it's just triple whammy. And I want you to go into this real quick and then we'll ask the final question. But competition. You know, they, they also there's so much competition. There's a, so much institutional investors in Texas, but not only institutional investors, mom and pop shops. So can you talk about what you're seeing as far as the data with apartment uh, occupancy? Uh, perhaps you're seeing free rents advertised. What's going on? Boots on the ground from a com competition standpoint out there. Absolutely. So, yeah. So apartment occupancy, local news presented. It's 87 percent now in San Antonio, expected to drop to 84% by the end of the year. So multifamily, there's a lot of building of new multifamily. Um, and if you talk about the institutional side, Tricon, large institutional investor, rents a lot of homes. What they've been doing is essentially offering as much as you know a month free and free deposit. So essentially two months off of your rent. And obviously they're doing this because they don't want to lower the sticker price. They want to sort of give you an, it's kind of the same idea as the builders, right? Initially, they didn't want to lower the sticker price. They said, we'll give you a rate buy down so we can keep the sticker price high. Uh, and that, you know, but now we're seeing that, you know, they're not able to clearly uh, rent for what they expected to rent them for. And they're also, uh, you know, yeah, I think, I think rents are softening. The idea is people will say, hey, if homeowners, if people can't afford to buy homes, well, these investors will just come in and buy them. And I push back on that because one, I, they were doing that at a time when, you know, fixed income, as an example, was paying such a small percent, it was paying almost nothing, right? So they were looking for 5% at that time would be good. Well, now you have increasing costs in property taxes. You have, if they were to buy new ones, obviously the interest rates are much higher to borrow. So there's all these factors where I just don't believe they can continue passing on the rents. And I think we're starting to see that. I think for as long as they can, they'll try to offer incentives and make it, you know, seem like they're not lowering the sticker price. But at the end of the day, I think we're, we're seeing that the consumer is tapped out that they're not able to pass on their, their incremental costs onto the consumer in the form of rents. And so they're having to do something about it. And, you know, honestly, Sean, I feel like being that we're in San Antonio or in Texas, I think this is ground zero. I think this will spread to the rest of the nation. I think that we kind of have, you know, up front and center. But to reiterate what you said for the viewers, basically, Sean said by, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, but by roughly December 2024, the vacancy rate is going to be 84%. So there'll, uh, there'll be 16% vacancy rate. So that's insane. First of all, 16% is astonishing and you're already seeing before we're at the end of the year some institutional investors some investors offering two essentially two months of free rent that's crazy it's softening we may not see it in the numbers but be the reason is is the loopholes the games that they play and so that brings me exactly kind of rounding up sean to the last thing again as a citizen, a U.S. citizen, as someone that wants to purchase a home that's on the sideline, I'm renting right now. This is great news. This excites me. I'm happy to see this. I'm like, wow, institutional investors are fire selling. It's only a matter of time before even more and more houses are being fire sold. And hopefully by that time, rates will also be going down. So this is great news. But my question, Sean, is how does the everyday U.S. consumer, citizen, citizen, 
use the tools at their disposal to see if the same thing is happening in their markets. Obviously, we have special markets, you and I. We see this everywhere. But how can we help people that are watching this video use tools to find this out in their markets? Absolutely. So if you'll go ahead and let me share again, I'm going to just pull up Bear County uh, CAD. It's essentially the, the property records for Bear County. And okay. so know, one of the things is, is that, want... uh, Sean, is that the, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but for the viewers, is that the appraisal district? Yes. So go to your first step. You go to whatever county you, you live in, appraisal district, correct? Right. Or I just, yeah, I think CAD, I think is county appraisal district or central appraisal district. And so you just want to search for your county and appraisal district or CAD. And they all have websites where you can go. Some of them are better than others and, and a better search functions than others. But you can go and you can see here for Bear County in San Antonio, you could search by the owner. And so if we wanted to just look and take a look at first key homes, where do they own all these homes? You know, you can see just by the owner's name. But one of the things that's a little tricky about, you'll see there's different names here, even under FKH. And some of the names that are first key homes don't even say first key homes. They'll say, you know, you'll, you'll notice sometimes these very generic names for LLCs because they split their properties into a lot of different LLCs. So one thing you can always do is go look on the uh, appraiser website and you can look at what is the mailing address for the owner. And so you'll notice there will be times when it may be a different name, mm -hmm. but it will be the same mailing address for the owner. And so you can then kind of know, or let's say you wanted to look at a particular street, you were interested in a new construction community, and you wanted to see you know, how many homes uh, are, are, who owns the homes uh, in that in that particular community, in that particular street. I don't want to put the owner's names necessarily on, on this yes. public video, but what you can do is you can go and search and I'll just, I'll, I'll filter it a little bit so that I'm only searching for this investor. But let's say I left off the owner name. I went and searched. You can see here all of the homes that First Key Homes owns on Arid Way. And so if you are considering buying in a community, one of the things you could do is go and see, hey, who really owns these homes? Are these individuals? Is there one large company that has bought up a significant portion of them? And, you know, you would maybe want to look into and try to understand why, you know, and one of the reasons Sean, that, that, yes. Uh, just real quick, I want the viewers to fully grasp what what they're saying is so if, if I could just break you for a second, what Sean has did is he's typed in for the owner. He's abbreviated, you know, first key, but he's also increased the filter to just the street. And what you guys are seeing right here is you're just seeing the street. It looks like arid way. And you're seeing that on that street that it looks like the entire street is owned by first key in the institutional investor and the reason well, and why i've only important. filtered here for the ones that oh sorry i've uh you have to edit that well I've, well real quick sean i was going to say the reason why this is important is is if if again if you're going to purchase a home from an institutional investor or anywhere do your due diligence on the neighborhood go on and, and then and please finish what you're saying yeah, I was just going to say this is presenting only the ones they own because I didn't want to bring up. But if you'll look and I have maps and things that I show in, in videos of where you can see the split of the individuals and the investors. So the investor bought a big chunk, but there are individuals right there on the same street, too. I find that they often are buying about a fourth of them. And that could be that the builder or HOA has you know caps on how many can be owned by investors. But yeah, you just want to go look at the street you're interested in. The other thing that I think citizens should be able to look into, especially if you're looking at new construction, is also look on the property assessor website. How many homes does the builder own on the street? Mm -hmm. Right? Because mm -hmm. one of the other things I've found is that the builders will present how many homes they have for sale, but oftentimes the amount that they own and, and some of them are just lots. They're not fully built homes. But there's a lot of examples where that you just see the builder's name over and over again on a street because they've started building on a street and maybe plans to build a lot of homes. But especially as we're seeing incre uh, inventories skyrocket, we're not really seeing pendings increase very much. 
you know, there, you may end up in a situation where you thought this neighborhood was going to be completed, but they slow down the building or they decide to sell to investors or they take some other step than in a hot market they otherwise wouldn't have. You want to know how many does the builder own? How many do investors own? And, you know, who owns the homes on this street? And Sean, great piece of the formula. But, you know, I'm sitting back again, you know, a citizen that I'm excited about this data because I want an affordable house. But but I'm still we're missing something, we're missing something from the formula. Um, and, and again, I'm leaning on you because you have this amazing visualization of data. You've done this yourself. But the key that, that now I'm wondering, OK, so it makes sense. Go to my appraisal district, the county website, go to the property search and search by owner's name or even the street, you know, the start of the street name. But where do we go and how do we find these properties for sale? Do you go and put the same thing in like Zillow, the street name in Zillow? Or how are you finding the properties that are for sale from institutional investors? That's that's a great question. So I've been using for quite some time. It's a it's a resource that actually Ashley, I think, mentioned on your channel as well. But it's called PropWire. And I have a love-hate relationship with this type of website because I, I think this website is why I get calls from people asking to buy my home all the time because it provides a lot of data for free for anybody. And I think that's who's typically using it is people who are trying to do wholesaling deals and things like that. But it provides a lot of data. Now, you should still vet it because I think they're aggregating from a lot of different places. Occasionally, you'll notice data that's out of date from there. But it's a good starting place where you can go on PropWire you can search. It even has filters for how many homes does the owner own, right? So that you could see who's a large investor that has homes for sale. And you can use that to kind of look into your local market and have an idea of who some of these sellers are. And, and like I said, there's a little bit of manipulation you have to do because they. You, I usually look at how many homes are for sale by the address, right? Because they have many different LLC names for these investors, you know, and so, but the, the way that you tie them all together is the owner's address. Okay. And what you showed us was in Georgia as an example. That's the, that's the um, first key homes, right. Sort of mailing office address. Right. So they may have, and some of them are very generic names, right? Sometimes you look at who owns this house and it's, you know, SFR single family rental, fund number three. And you're like, okay, well, that doesn't tell me much, but you can then go and you say, okay, well, let me take that address and plug it into Google and see okay. who's there. And then you yeah. start to realize, okay, now I know who this is. Right. And, and that's how you take all those different LLCs and see, you know, who is it really? It sounds like Sean, that again, that's an amazing website. I have a question, but for the viewers, that's propwire.com. P-R-O-P, prop. -P, and then wire, W-I-R-E.com. I'm with the slow reading group and I can still spell it. Is that free, Sean? Do you know, is that service free for, for citizens or do you have to pay a subscription? I think they have a paid version, but it's free. You can, you can use a free version of it. Um, I think what you have to pay for is if you wanted to look up, you know, contact information for the, the owner or something like that. I think you pay for that, but that's not what I'm using it for. That's more what the wholesaler type people would be using it for. But just for me, looking for information and looking for things to, I kind of use it as to flag things to then go look into in other sources, right? And so, but but again, the appraisal um, data is good too. I mean, some places give you full access, like you can download their whole, all of their property appraisal data from the county, which makes it really easy, you know, to work with if you're good with data. Some of them only let you search in a web portal, but others let you download the whole thing. And then you can start really looking at, you know, how many homes do builders own? How many homes do investors own? You know, that sort of thing. I hope the viewers really take the initiative to use that uh, website and software, man, because that is so valuable if they haven't been using it. I mean, if you guys really want to dig into the house market, you guys know it's local. I'm preaching all about local, local neighborhoods, subdivisions. That's why it was so cool to see Sean pull up that map where it was a high concentration of investment owned properties. Because again, the narrative, oh, they only own 0.1% of the pie. Well, not in subdivisions like that. Not, not when my neighbor is a hundred other renters. It, it matters to that person, certainly. And I want, you know, we've been talking for about 35 minutes. I want to wrap us up, Sean. You want to go ahead and, uh, you know, 
the give us the last words. And before you do, to the viewers, don't forget, go to RE Watchman on YouTube. Subscribe. He's also on X. Uh, Sean, last words, brother. Sure. Well, I just want to thank you so much for, for allowing me to be here to talk with you. Uh, you know, I, I really, as you can tell, I'm passionate about people being able to have information. I think there's huge information asymmetry in in real estate, right? What the builder knows and or what the realtor knows, sometimes it's not necessarily what the citizen knows. So, uh, you know, I really think there's a lot of ways that we as consumers, and I think your channel has really done a lot to help that, to where we can be a little bit more equipped to make these decisions and know that a lot of this data is out there. It's just about knowing how to use it and taking the time to do it, to be informed on what is a you know, big financial decision in your life. So I, uh, I'm on YouTube, like you mentioned, I'm on X. I do tweet you know, kind of things out specific to San Antonio, but I have a number of other topics I'm interested in and, and um, kind of working on. And uh, yeah, it's just been really great to, to get to connect with you. I, I first got connected with you from uh, tweeting Melody Wright and Melody you know, looked at a chart that I had tweeted out and, and we got in touch and then I got to meet you all. And so it just, it just shows you how uh, you know, the, the power for social media to connect people and how people can be more informed about what's going on now because there's so much information out there and ways to connect. So thank you so well, much for having me. Well said, brother. I'm going to get us out of here. I couldn't have said it better myself. Now, if you guys are out there investing in real estate, you guys know that we wish you luck and we hope you win.